like a room temperature knife through a block of ice. That is a single crystal substrate. It's a block of ice, all right. Oof, oh my god. All the little dendritic bits. Oh man, that's bright. That's better. Oh man, well that didn't work. Okay, so I need to back up and explain what I was trying to do here, why it didn't work, and what I learned instead. First of all, let's start at the very beginning. This is ice. And that's a loud bird. Ice has a hexagonal crystal structure. Strictly speaking, it has all the symmetries of the P63CM space group, but uh, we're not gonna get that complicated. Basically, just know that the six in that means six-fold symmetry, so it's like a hexagon. I read a paper a while ago where they actually used a lens like this with a bright, like an arc lamp or the sun or whatnot, to heat up a spot in the center of a block of ice. Like if you could bring it to a focus while it was in the ice. And they used this to melt it from the inside out. And they made a little bit of a void inside this block of ice. And when that void refroze, it actually formed a tiny little hexagon. Like it was a little clear hexagonal prism of void inside of a block of ice. And I thought, man, that's really cool. I should try to do that. Unfortunately, it, uh, it doesn't seem to have worked. Do you see any tiny hexagons in here? Because I sure don't. Instead, we're seeing this like really weird sort of fine-grained cellular structure. And that's because this is not a single crystal of water ice like they used in that study. This is actually polycrystalline ice. And the lens focused on this block of ice has actually revealed a really interesting structure. Despite being completely clear before I started to melt it, uh, this is actually not one piece of ice. So what does it really mean to be single crystalline? So I've made a few videos about crystals now, and if you're curious about water, the unit cell looks like this. That means that an ice cube is just this pattern of molecules repeated over and over again in all directions. In a recent video where I made crystalline structures out of soap bubbles on water, not, you know, quite the same scale as atoms, I glossed over an important point. In all of the clips that made it into the video, the entire raft of bubbles had the same pattern of hexagonal arrangements. A hexagon here lines up with a hexagon over here. But in actuality, I had to work pretty hard to achieve this. In most cases, if you just sort of let the bubbles stick together and congeal randomly, you get these separate domains. A hexagon over here might not actually line up with a hexagon over here or over here. And these regions, or grains, are separated by grain boundaries, where the material is disordered and not actually crystalline. These grain boundaries normally have a lot of extra space in them because the packing doesn't really work. All the atoms don't fit together. Structurally speaking, they're a real mess. This is called a polycrystalline structure. And for most purposes, we treat it like a crystalline material. But in actuality, it's more like a whole bunch of different crystals that are just shaped such that they fit together. Even when I shined a very bright light, the focused sun, on this block of ice, it was hard to tell when you were looking at it from the side. The same way that light passing through air can only be seen if you put smoke in the way for it to scatter off of, light passing through a perfect crystalline solid has little reason to scatter within the material. That is, unless it hits a defect in the crystal. In this case, we see light bouncing around in tiny pores in the material, and the motion that we see is actually that water beginning to melt. On top of this, the disordered regions around grain boundaries, because they're so disordered, probably have a slightly lower melting point. So all of the energy from the incoming light is being absorbed preferentially at grain boundaries, which also take less energy to melt. So the result of all of this is that the grain boundaries melt first. 
leaving us with trenches on the surface and these really fine trails inside the block of ice showing exactly where one crystal grain ends and the next begins. I wasn't expecting to see, you know, these cellular structures, these long columnar grains made so clear by, you know, melting from a light source. So now we have this cool looking cellular structure. You may be asking, how do we know that these are grains? How do we know that the crystal symmetry in this grain is tilted with respect to the symmetry in this other grain? The answer to that is dendrites. In the first ice video, I talked about dendritic growth and how you can get this classic snowflake branching structure if you grew water ice under very specific conditions. I'll add to that now and say that dendrites actually only form in very specific crystallographic directions. So you can use them to sort of figure out what you're looking at. If you have a hexagonal unit cell for your crystal of water ice, material scientists would call this top face with the hexagonal symmetry the C plane or basal plane. And then the faces of the prism are in the M directions and the edges are in the A directions. Dendrites form in the A directions. So if you see a branching dendrite structure, you can be sure that perpendicular to that structure is your C direction, the hexagonal one. I believe this is a function of thermal conductivity. As water freezes into ice, it produces heat, and that heat needs to be extracted. And if it can be extracted most efficiently in the A directions, then those directions are going to grow fastest. If we zoom in to the fully grown block of ice, we can see these little residual feathery dendritic structures all over the place. If we use these structures to index directions in the crystal, this dendrite would suggest that the C direction points this way. But this other dendrite says that the C direction must point this way. So these two cannot be part of the same crystal grain. It's really interesting that even once you've grown a solid block of ice, you can see sort of residual strain and defects from when that ice formed. I think it's very much like taking a sheet of paper and creasing it a whole bunch of times and then unfolding it. It looks like one continuous piece, but you can still see the creases. But now we get to the real crux. Why is this ice polycrystalline? I mean, I was trying to grow a single crystal, so what happened? At the start of this process, I was extremely careful to make a seed crystal that I thought only contained one set of crystal symmetry. All of the water ice in that seed crystal was pointed the same way. I did this by isolating a single dendrite and setting it on a block of aluminum that I'd been keeping in the freezer. So it was probably in the vicinity of about minus 20 Celsius. The very cold block of metal absorbed energy from the melting dendrite freezing it to the bar and lowering its temperature. I slowly pipetted more water on top of the dendrite, and then that liquid water froze and should have just been sort of lining itself up with the existing pattern. Like you've got a block of ice there. If you have liquid water that sticks to that block of ice, it's not gonna make its own crystal. It's just gonna add to the pattern that already exists. That process is called epitaxy. At this point, I had a big single crystal chunk of water stuck to an aluminum bar. And my hope was that if I placed this bar upside down with the seed crystal touching the liquid water surface, that water would lose its thermal energy through the metal bar and slowly turn to ice with liquid depositing on the seed crystal and epitaxially growing a large single crystal of water ice. If this had worked properly, there'd be no way for dendrites to form in this container. As water reached zero degrees, its density would drop and it would float to the surface of the container and stick to the seed crystal in a very slow, even way. Unfortunately, there were dendrites in the container the next morning, so something went wrong. In order to get dendrites in the container, that means that at some point that water actually dropped below zero degrees Celsius. So it was super cooled and it was super cooled despite the fact that there was a block of ice touching that water. All of that really cold water should have just been able to stick to that ice, but it didn't for some reason. The only explanation that I can think of for this is that that water ice stuck to that aluminum bar was really bad at removing energy from the system. 
and the whole body of water was actually sitting in the freezer. So despite the fact that I had it sitting on foam and insulated with a towel, eventually that water cooled and it cooled to below zero degrees Celsius. At that point, it was able to nucleate new crystals via dendritic growth and then all of those crystals later stuck together into a single polycrystalline block of ice. It turns out that trying to control the flow of heat through a material like this is really difficult without building a lot of custom equipment. If you ask me to you know, design the perfect apparatus to move heat through a block of water ice, I could draw it for you right now, but based on the experiments that I've done in the garage, I wouldn't want to pay to build it. <laughs> there are a handful of methods used to produce single crystals in research. The, I think one of the most common is the Bridgman technique, where you actually are cooling one side of the material and heating one side of the material and moving the heat and cold sources back and forth. You can actually control exactly where the solid to liquid front is and get it to move through the liquid very slowly. Um, there's another technique where you can start solidifying a material through like a corkscrew of a container. So that if you start with a polycrystalline material, by the time it has epitaxially deposited all the way through this corkscrew, you've extinguished all but one grain. I also found some research that claimed that the atmosphere was actually very important to getting facets on water ice. And that if you were able to grow water ice like in a vacuum where there were no dissolved gases in the water, that you'd get flat facets as opposed to smooth ice. But for some reason, I wasn't able to get that to work, even at relatively small scale. So I'm not 100% sure if it's actually possible to, from a melt, as in from liquid water, grow faceted solid ice crystals. I was later able to make it work with vapor deposition. So instead of freezing a liquid into a solid, you're depositing a vapor into a solid. And with that technique, I was able to get single crystals. And an upcoming video is going to detail that process. But I wanted to at least show you some of these examples, some of the things that didn't work because only talking about the successes doesn't feel very scientific, and I wanted to share some of my thought process on the way. Of course, the vapor growth came with plenty of challenges of its own, so if you're not subscribed, subscribe, and you'll get to see that video in hopefully the very near future. I've got one growing in the fridge right now.